it's always nice to be able to talk about something that uh, is something that uh, is known to most of us. So I'd like to ask first a question. How many of you have used cognition before? So that's something that we all do. That's all people, every, every people, every person does. Uh, we think we do something like, like we need to figure out things in our head. So my name is Simo Helsten. I work as a full stack developer uh, at Druid. And uh, I studied some computer science, and uh, also here in this town, town where I did some uh, human computer interaction studies like about 20 years ago. Uh, I do a little bit about accessibility with uh, W3C community groups, and uh, also I'm uh, mostly I work with Drupal CMS, so it's and I only do a little bit with WordPress, so it's not my expertise, WordPress, but I do a lot of other stuff, and this is something that's really common for everything. And at home, I have four dogs, four cats, and a wife and a daughter. Actually, my daughter is here <laughs> as well. Uh, and uh, my presentation is something like an introductory to the topic. So I'm not a psychology major. I'm more with computer science, so I have a kind of a hands-on approach on these topics. And this is beginner level. Most of this stuff I have here is something that you can read from uh, uh, psychology textbooks. So it's something you can continue studying yourself when you find some, if you find this interesting. And I have some examples, but mostly I talk a little bit about the theory. And it's mostly about the visual perception. And uh, because uh, a lot of this is about visual perception, uh, this uh, presentation won't be accessible to everyone. So it's kind of a limited accessibility because it focuses pretty much on visual stuff. So far, first, I'd like to say something about the, like the main title, what never changes. Uh, we are what we are. We are built in a certain way. Uh, we have certain kind of nerve structure, and uh, well, Socrates, who lived like thousands of years ago, a few thousand years ago, had the same kind of nerve structure that the current chess champion Gary Gasparov has. So it's not so much different. The cells are what make us work. Uh, the tennis champion Serena Williams, uh, she has the same kind of eyes, optical nerves, same kind of receptors that uh, the first Olympic athletes had. So this is something that is something kind of constant. Uh, the written history, th the things we know about humans is something that uh, it's very short time for, like that's kind of hard way to change. Uh, so anato anatomically we have been the same for several, uh, a few hundred thousand years and uh, we, uh, what makes us special, what makes us able to think is our uh, prefrontal cortex, which is kind of has many folds, so that it has a lot of surface, so it can fit a lot of neurons. So that's kind of a, the thing that makes us a little bit different from other mammals. But what has changed significantly uh, in the few thousand years is how we live, what kind of tools we use, and what kind of interaction we have with the things that surround us. So basically we have two kind of things. We have our hardware, which is the same, has been the same for a long time. So our brain structure, photoreceptor cells in our eyes, our auditory nerves, those are basically the same. And we have our software, which is our memory processes, our ways to like problem solving methods and learning methods. And this software is something that, that keeps changing. We can develop ourselves even in our uh, individual lifetime. We can use, uh, we can try to change how, how this software part works. So there are limitations, of course, with how the sof software works because of the hardware. But this is something that there is uh, kind of this kind of distinction. And of course, there's a lot of variation between people, how we work. So 
there are people who have different kind of photoreceptor cells uh, missing something or they behave differently, different kind of a, a brain structure. So there's a lot of variation, but the uh, basics are more or less the same. And uh, what we know about how we think, how we kind of uh, receive information from the uh, surrounding world and how we process it. Uh, we have always been interested uh, during history uh, about cognition, how people think and work. So uh, the first person was in the uh, 5th century before uh, current era in Greece who kind of connected brain, our internal organ, to our mind. And the first kind of written examples about uh, that kind of re relates to cognitive psychology was by Aristotle in 350 before current era. And uh, kind of Aristotle brought one piece that could almost be said that it, it relates to webcag. So it's how kind of uh, distracting elements uh, make it confusing to use. Uh, but all the time, uh, knowledge has been accumulate, uh, accumulated over time. Uh, so that we learn more and more and we maybe take some side steps and then combine information. So uh, it was in 1890 that William James identified the short-term and long-term memory distinction. That's something that we usually we believe that, that it exists. Uh, then it was uh, at the same time in Germany there was uh, Wilhelm Wundt who kind of used introspection uh, to study human cognition and early 20th century. Uh, there was this uh, school of Gestalt school who documented many current, cu current uh, what we think about as keep, uh, consider facts about human, per uh, like how we perceive things. And then in the US, especially uh, in 1912, uh, John V. Watson started what is called behaviorism uh, in psychology, so a different kind of studying external reactions, where, while the German guy was studying just internal thoughts. And uh, in 1956, uh, there was a group of uh, people in the US who started what is called cognitive revolution. So they started combining psychology, linguistics, computer science, anthropology, neuroscience, psychology into this kind of a one group of studies that was, co started, uh, was called cognitive psychology. So combining different disciplines. Uh, so I mentioned intro, uh, introspection and behaviorism. Uh, so it's kind of two different, totally di very different thing, ways to look at the same issues. So introspection, uh, where you kind of look at how you feel about something. How do I think, I think. So that's something that kind of comes up in usability and uh, in accessibility, in kind of this uh, expert reviews or uh, usable heuristics. Uh, and on the other hand, the other other side, behaviorism is something that where you observe how somebody reacts, but you don't like, uh, you have to figure it out what's inside the person's head. Uh, so that's kind of something that's uh, kind of similar to uh, usability testing, user testing, that kind of where you observe the behavior of someone using the site. So that does kind of exist still today as different kinds of tools. Uh, in cognitive psychology, uh, uh, starting in the 50s, the idea was to bring the scientific method to st uh, study human cognition. So, uh, and it was built like uh, there were some key key writings about it, but you can look it up. Uh, it's, uh, but the kind of the idea of the scientific method is to describe, describe behavior, uh, predict behavior, uh, determine causes of the behavior, and then uh, finally explain the behavior. Uh, and that scientific method was applied to study human intelligence, language, perception, attention, memory, thinking, consciousness, and learning. So in this presentation, I mostly have about uh, things about perception, a little bit about attention and about memory, uh, but the focus on is on perception. Uh, and it's kind of a, there is a 
I, I, I personally see this, this distinction between average and extreme. So uh, I, I think uh, mostly cognitive psychology, it mostly focuses on the average. Uh, there is this uh, Miller's rule of, of magical number seven. It's about memory, how many items we can process in our uh, working memory. So it's uh, average number seven, but there is kind of wide range of different difference in people. Whereas uh, extreme is something that is what we study when we try to understand accessibility. With accessibility, we uh, very much focus on the extreme cases because that's way how we uh, uh, get the results. And uh, with the usability and maybe especially with marketing or something like that, we more 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 maybe focus on the average. And uh, so this is what I talk about, it's uh, mostly about the average. Uh, when we start to look at these uh, same issues from the extreme perspective, then we need to look at uh, kind of that uh, little bit different point of view and then maybe look at something like cognitive accessibility guidance, uh, like the supplemental stuff that's not even in the webcag, so that's kind of extends. So there we can start looking at the like description about the extremes in cognition. Uh, and when I talk, like when we, how we understand the word, uh, we start with, uh, we get some kind of a uh, stimuli, uh, stimulus uh, from the surrounding world. So we get input from the outside world. That's how we uh, create our image, our internal uh, image on what's happening anywhere. Uh, so, in like we have a real life, uh, real surroundings are three D, but uh, with uh, with uh, websites we usually have just two uh, D things, and uh, yeah, and then when we look at things, we look at the computer screen. Uh, our eyes receive this uh, digital stimulus from the screen, and it's reflected uh, to our retina. Uh, to the cells, and then we receive the proximal stimulus, and then we process. Uh, then it travels to our brain, into our uh, memory processing, and that's uh, percept there. And uh, we receive information mostly to our eyes when we use websites. And uh, we have like uh, there are two theories of how we see colors, and the kind of uh, usually nowadays it's kind of thought that these two theories complement each other. So it's kind of, it's not either or, it's both. So we have uh, three three kinds of uh, cells in our eyes that uh, kind of read different color wavelengths of, of uh, light. And we have blue, uh, green and red cells. So we are RGB, uh, not SMIC. And, uh, yeah, so, and the kind of, it's kind of this also distributed a little bit differently in our eyes. So in the center, we have uh, green and red and around our eyes, we have blue. And then it's kind of a, the other theory is kind of this about opposing colors. So we have, we register kind of uh, these color pairs, blue and orange and red and green and that kind of thing. So it's kind of, that's how we used, that's how we perceive the images. We also have two ways of thinking or kind of receiving information. So it's called top down and bottom up processes. So bottom up process starts from the sensory input. We see something and then we start processing it. And uh, then we kind of, kind of organize the things we saw into some kind of whole. And the top-down process, uh, we have expectations. We kind of think we know something and then we seek confirmation through our senses. So uh, we, we think that we expect to have some sort of result and then we scan our surroundings and collect information that supports our expectations or maybe contradicts it, but it's often like the kind of two different approaches we use for kind of figuring out what's happening. And uh, we also have different uh, input 
different nerves and also uh, for sensing audio and also audio is processed, processed uh, in different part of our brain than from our visual input. Uh, and as we receive different kinds of stimuli uh, all the time, we need to kind of, uh, we can't just try to understand everything. We need to use our attention to focus on what is relevant. And it's also, there are different kinds of theories on what kind of filters we use and what kind of kind of pathways there is for our attention and how we select what we focus on. And uh, one way of uh, it, uh, like example of attention is visual search. Uh, so when we have an object that is uh, like clearly clear different from the other ones, it's easy to focus on that one. So when we have uh, like a group of red dots and one blue dot. It's very easy to find that uh, blue dot where it is. Where it is. Uh, but then when the kind of a, uh, we need to uh, use combination of features. Like if, if the color is the only thing that needs our attention, then it's easy. If we need to find the blue dot, when we have a combination of, uh, in addition to the blue dot, we have uh, red dots and uh, blue diamonds. So when we need to combine different characteristics, then we need to do a lot more processing in our brain and then it gets harder. So that's kind of a uh, things we want to be able to use when we do websites as well. And uh, yeah, and back to the hardware, uh, we have memory like computers. So we have uh, our RAM, our working memory where we can, uh, we use to when we are uh, focusing on something, we are actually working on something that we use our working memory. We have a sensory memory that's a uh, very short term. It's kind of a buffers for input. And then uh, we have this uh, storage for a long time, uh, storing information for a long time. And uh, like that uh, working memory is about 20 to 30 seconds. It lasts 10, 20 to 30 seconds, and when we then we need to repeat stuff to be able to work on it for a longer time. And usually we can work with groups of uh, seven plus minus two uh, items at one time, and then we can do different kinds of grouping to increase our memory. And then it's different kinds of yeah, but I won't go into detail on that. And then uh, storing memories, we use different kind of uh, references to between nodes. So uh, in Word, WordPress, I think we could use uh, terms like article and linking articles and stuff, stuff like that. But in Drupal, it's the Drupal actually uses the same, uh, a little bit same, similar terms, nodes, as we use in uh, cognitive psychology or neurology for connecting those things. And also we have a part of our long-term memories, uh, uh, episodic memory, and then we store also time steps for different uh, memory, like dif different things we store in our memory. So it's kind of, we kind of combine with different neural paths. What, uh, yeah, what we remember there. Uh, so next I go to this kind of uh, rules of perception. So this is uh, from the guys in Germany in 1920s. Uh, these are the Gestalt principles uh, that some kind of this can be used for creating illusions, but also how to kind of organize stuff so that it's easy to understand on easy to kind of process cognitively. Uh, so uh, there are uh, seven kind of these original principles or a couple of combinations. Uh, so one principle is figure ground. Uh, so we can see either on the uh, right side image, we can either see two face, two white face, faces facing each other, or then we can see a kind of a candlestick. So we can choose which way to look at it, and it, it kind of can, can change. Uh, then uh, similarity is very, similarity uh, is very uh, important principle when we do website design. Uh, for usability or accessibility. So 
we easily group similar shapes and similar colors into one group. So it's uh, even spaces between those different uh, circles or dots and then we can easily organize it into black dots and white dots. So that is what we do instinctively. And another principle is proximity. Pro proximity. So if we have this one block of dots that doesn't have similarity, it's just one block. But when, when we add space so that some of them are closer to each other than others, then we immediately see that these are kind of connected, these into groups. So that's uh, and uh, similarity is something that uh, is useful for kind of a showing the use of what to do and what kind of things you can do. So this is a bit older version of confluence. Somebody, uh, some people, some of you, I think, are familiar with this software. And here in the older version, we have when uh, origin first I click create button on the top uh, toolbar, and then I get this page. And then I have, still I have that like inviting blue create button. And then I have uh, uh, like in the top right hand corner, I have this similar blue publish button. And that's kind of a little bit confusing because at least for me, I'm not maybe not that smart. Uh, so I instinctively, uh, after typing text, I click create. I'm creating a new page. So I type in text and click create. So I didn't realize that it actually had already curated a page and then I need to publish it. So it's kind of a not so clear. I, I think it's because of the similarity of two, two buttons. Uh, in newer version of Confluence, they added so that you have the view where you click create and then you get this uh, full, uh, full screen model where you only have that publish. So you don't have competing uh, items that are similar. So it's very easy then to see that, okay, next I need to click the blue button again, but it's a different blue button. So this kind of uh, uh, helps user to focus less strain on attention. And uh, with uh, Jira from the same uh, Atlassian product also, uh, Jira, uh, at least this version I was using, has a different uh, strategy for doing the same thing. So. Here, clicking create button uh, creates this kind of a, a sh shadow. Uh, it opens this model and this uh, like overlay color so that it reduces similarity by making the other blue darker. So it also affects the same result. Focus is on the correct blue button. And also another example using proximity. proximity so this is something like a, it was a dev, like a, a development project, and the uh, like backend coder had came up with this uh, user interface where they had this kind of on like rows. They had a, like this label, one radio button, and another radio button, and next row label, radio button, radio button. So this is something that uh, obviously you can see that you th start thinking that that uh, like vertical lines of radio buttons are connected because they are close to each other. So it's kind of, <coughs> but then it doesn't make any sense again, any, any sense at all, because then you have two radio buttons. So uh, this is what just a very simple CSS change. So I, I added like, uh, just make it a flex box and make it a little bit different. And then we have kind of more, uh, more understandable way of looking at. The, so the groupings are then kind of, uh, they make sense. So. So the connected radio buttons are there. So you could use maybe, because it's only two, two options, you might want to use some other kind of uh, widget there. But yeah, I don't remember what, if there could be maybe more options as well in that interface. But that's very simple thing of, and this kind, kind of something that Germans figure out in 1920. Uh, and we should avoid styling too much similarity. So nowadays we can, like, it was easier in the old days when you just had that. You could only add that uh, HTML tag and can't do so much else, maybe add, change some colors. But now we can do almost everything with CSS. And we should avoid styling uh, uh, with too much similarity. So uh, uh, in the last uh, bullet point, I have there two 
uh, two inputs. One of them is a text field, and the other one is well, it's not input; it's button. Uh, but so uh, no, it's input; it's submit, submit. Yeah, so it's input. Uh, anyway, so we can style them to look almost exactly the same, and then the user get, gets confused which one is which. So keeping it distinct, not too much similarity, so that it's easy to comprehend what's happening. Uh, so this kind of a straw man. <laughs> so usually we don't do things like that, but it could happen. Uh, and also variation uh, on text fields. So some people, I, I noticed that some people like to make it even, like uh, eaching lines, uh, like changing lines. So equal, long, long, broken, long. So this kind of, it's symmetric, it looks nice from certain point of view, but it's not really usable. So here we also want to avoid similarity. We want to kind of have uh, the inputs to ha ha kind of to be different for different kind of uh, content. So zip code shouldn't be as long as address or not even as long as town. So it's just have variation, reduce similarity. It makes it easier to process in our brain, our cognition gets a lot of lot of stress, especially from Facebook and other social media, so we shouldn't add that also in our websites. Uh, the next principles here on the same page, uh, uh, it's the same region, so this is a special case of, oh, there's some kind of zoom effect, a special case of proximity. Uh, uh, proximity. Uh, so, uh, even if we see proximity, proximity with the O's uh, or, or circles, so there are some of them are very close to each other, and there there is one group that is uh, kind of more distant. So that's kind of with proximity only we would see that there is a one big group and one small group. But then we can add some lines. So same region uh, principle we can use to kind of uh, break them apart. So when we draw small lines, uh, then we we can see, kind of process them as two groups uh, with the same amount of, the same numbers of items in them. Uh, and the, yeah, this is actually, yeah. And the common fate on the next side, there are a few things that are doing the same kind of action, moving. So then we start thinking, yeah, those things are related kind of even run, random sample, if they move the same way, then we kind of, our brains think that, okay, these are similar. Uh, might date back to some people trying to hunt some, hunt some animals and the pack moves so you can see, oh yeah, that's a group of animals there or something like that. So it's kind of probably dates uh, into some very ancient times. And Common fate, it comes up maybe we some have some kind of lazy loading thing. So we sometimes have some animations that so show that these things are still loading. So there we can see that these are similar kind of items or some other kind of animations we use to signal that something is processing. And uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of the common fate. Uh, then we have different kinds of grids and groupings. Uh, so uh, we have this, uh, we can resize the screen and then we can have the same uh, same CSS grid showing items uh, that are kind of grouped differently depending on the size of the screen. So this is also where we can apply these principles. And then uh, we have the principle of continuation where instead of following the color, we follow the, where we expect the line to continue. Then there is uh, closure and filling, so we can see instead of just uh, uh, three three sectors, we can see the triangle in the middle and complete the things. And this is also something that we should take into account that when we do some icons, uh, people can complete them in different ways. So it's kind of to make sure that there is only one obvious way of uh, completing it. And then uh, we prefer symmetry and symmetrical objects. So we here uh, in the uh, blue and or blue and gray picture, we tend to focus on the gray because they are symmetric, and we think uh, of the blue as background usually because it's 
asymmetric. And wood figure is uh, completing simple shapes. So when we saw that uh, the first one the, on the top left corner, the or two orange uh, boxes, we think that they're both like in the bottom part. They are just overlapped, but they are full. We don't think of them as one being this kind of reversed L shape, shape and the other one being a boss. So we kind of complete the image in our mind. And this uh, good figure uh, is something we use when we have uh, tabs on websites. So we kind of think that, yeah, this, these are things that have content here, it's just behind. So we kind of uh, realize that this is something that uh, exists there. Uh, so th these are something that, is, that exists there already, but we just can't see it because there is something on the way. This is also something that when we uh, relate things to kind of our physical world, world experiences, and this is also something that comes up with uh, Jakobsen, uh, kind of this old school usability people. They said they say that we should keep connection between the re like physical world and the web world because that's how our brains are used to thinking. And uh, with uh, like increasing number of elderly people who don't have so long so much experience with computers, so it's very useful for them also to have this uh, bridge between physical world and uh, the what like the two dimensional. Uh, then this is no longer the uh, Gestalt principles, but there are different kind of consensus where we also similar to that uh, uh, similar to that uh, uh, word figure, we also fill up the spaces in our head with our past experience and how we expect things to be. So these two color images uh, uh, here, the papers are the same uh, color values in the. Uh, image, so it's same RGB values, but we see them differently because of the kind of, because of the background is different. So we correct colors in our images. There are some images that only have gray colors, but images are of strawberries. So we start seeing them as red. And this kind of, that's the Japanese guy who has a lot of these nice illusions. Uh, size constancy, uh, when we kind of had this kind of a, uh, perspective, we kind of expect the top line to be longer than the bottom line because our brain fixes it. And then, uh, but actually it's the same pixel length. Also with the opening door, of course, the kind of pixels are totally different in these ones, but we also correct the image so that we kind of understand it's the same door, same shape. And also lightness con constancy, uh, this is similar to color, color constancy here because it's in, in the image we have shadow, we expect the shadow to be darker. But I don't know if you can, yeah, the A and B squares, uh, they are actually the same yeah. color values in the image. But our brain makes us believe that, like, brain tells us that there's different colors because of the shadows and how it's positioned and because it's a chessboard kind of. But actually, that, uh, RGB value is the same. And we have all kinds of expectations, memories, motives. And here, kind of, we, what we expect to see here. Read the second bullet point on the right, you see an old woman facing diagonally forwards. If you expect to see that, maybe you see that. If you read the third one on the right, you see a young woman facing diagonally backwards, maybe you see that. So it's kind of that we also, this is a, the top down bottom up process. So there's top down, we have expectations. And then we seek for uh, information to uh, complement our, like to fill our expectations. Uh, then there is another thing of how we, we process of maybe our uh, observations. So this is a geometric basic component. So this is something uh, just for information, I'm do not going to into it. This is something maybe for characters, typography, maybe more important or 3D objects. So we kind of uh, put it, take it apart and then build different kinds of basic shapes. Uh, and then with all this information, we could do a lot of things, de design very good things that are 
cognitively very superior, but we also have con conventions. It's also about expectations, uh, what what we expect and how they kind of interact. So this is a kind of why why we should use why we should respect conventions. Uh, this is something that uh, you can find it on the internet. Jacob Nielsen's uh, and uh, Hoal Lorenzo uh, list of why we should use conventions. Uh, and but sometimes we should all also break conventions. Some conventions are just not really plan planned. They just happened for some reasons. And better doesn't always win. Sometimes we users get used to bad solutions. And then uh, kind of, but when we start breaking conventions, we need to be able to do it so that we can replace the convention with a better version because we don't want uh, different kind of ways of doing things because it kind of confuses the users. Uh, like for instance, the default color blue, it has some, uh, the default color blue in links is something that kind of came up for some reason, it wasn't planned. But now uh, we have studied that we have our blue, uh, blue receptor cells are located around our eyes while green and red are in the middle. So it's kind of physically a little bit different. There are studies about how blue color reacts to, we react differently to blue color, but it was never intended. And uh, we're not, not sure if it has any significance, but it's kind of this different physiology, like, physiologically the blue color, but maybe it's not the reason it ended up being the link color. And uh, also, it, yeah, this is kind of a little bit example of uh, the kind of different ways of uh, using color to highlight and different grouping, also using Gestalt principles. So here we have one uh, one uh, accent color in a basic, very basic HTML, and we can kind of make it a little bit different using those principles, like changing colors, reducing similarity, and also using those um, uh, same containers to make it distinct. So just a small example of very simple HTML. But I'm not going to into this with detail. So whether beautiful or ugly, or just conven conveniently at hand, the world of experience is produced by the person who experiences it. So this is a quote from Ulrich Neisner, one of the like uh, originators of the cognitive revolutions. Thank you.